It's two years since West Country Live exposed the international paedophile ring which had its centre in Cornwall. Since then, children have continued to be abused in other parts of the country. In this special report, John Kiddy explores the background of today's case and its central character, Maurice Fraser. I was 13. I wrote... I met a sculptor and photographer and took 75 pictures of me, nude, and said I was a good figure and gave me five pounds. David was the victim of a paedophile. The man who abused him was a doctor. The doctor had abused other boys before, but the medical establishment allowed him to continue working. Dr. Morris Fraser is a consultant psychiatrist. You can check his credentials, as I did, by calling the General Medical Council. Good morning, Rosie. Can help you? Yes, good morning. Um, I've been referred to a psychiatrist called Dr. Fraser. I just wanted to check he's on the register. Well, he's, what it means is we've given him registration to work, so he's registered to work. I see. That's fine. Thanks a lot. Morris Fraser has been jailed in the past for abusing boys. The General Medical Council know about this, but they refuse to strike him off. They won't tell us why. Well, he is a career paedophile. Um, the offences that he has committed are not one-off offences. People in his position are clearly a danger to children. Two years ago, West Country revealed the link between Fraser and paedophiles in Britain, America and Europe. He had helped to found the Azimuth Trust, a charity in Cornwall which took children to sea without their parents. A fellow trustee, Mike Johnson, was jailed last year for abusing boys on his yacht. Until now, though, Fraser has escaped justice. Fraser, too, abused one of the children involved with the Azimuth Trust. That was in 1990. The boy made a statement to the police two years later, but Fraser wasn't charged. His arrest came, quite by chance, through a separate police inquiry hundreds of miles from the West Country. South Godstone in Surrey, a wealthy, prosperous and outwardly respectable village 30 miles from London. The boy we're calling David, that's not his real name, was brought here and sexually abused. He was just 13. At a house called Fiddler's Grove, which lies about half a mile down this private drive behind me, there was an art exhibition. Among those attending were several paedophiles. One of them saw Maurice Fraser in the company of the boy we're calling David. He asked Maurice Fraser if he could photograph the boy naked. He did so behind a barn in the grounds. Terence Waters was the photographer. Maurice Fraser allowed him to take pictures of David. Fraser had befriended David's family in Cornwall some time before. What the family didn't know at the time was that Maurice Fraser, the trusted doctor, the child psychiatrist, was a paedophile, a convicted child pornographer. And so too was Fraser's friend, Terence Waters. Waters was well known in his hometown of Chatham. He was the artist in residence at the local arts centre. He even painted a portrait of the mayor. In September last year, Waters was sent to jail for 10 years. He had taken obscene photographs of young boys in Kent. Ironically, he, like Mike Johnson, had lured the boys into helping him with his boat, which he kept moored on the River Medway. Some of the pictures were even taken at the Civic Arts Centre. Waters was convincing. A charming man, uh, ideal person to deal with, very polite, well-spoken, uh, intellectual. Um, so it comes across as a very honest person. In Waters' house, police found thousands of photographs. Among them were pictures of David, the ones he'd taken at the house in Surrey. Nothing to say. Why did you say I've nothing to say to you. Uh, about setting up Hazemist or Fraser? I've nothing to say to you. Why did you say that? After about? we revealed the truth the, about uh, Fraser in 1993, he was sacked from the job he'd obtained at a hospital in Southampton. Because he was still on the general medical register, his employers thought he was safe to treat their patients. Fraser, in fact, is part of another paedophile ring.
A BBC investigation last year discovered that Fraser was linked with a man called Peter Wrighton. Wrighton was a senior government advisor on child care, a man in a position of great trust. They both knew Charles Napier, a diplomat who was jailed this summer for sexually abusing boys. A network of paedophiles is operating here and abroad. It's not as if um, paedophiles meet regularly at a set venue like a sort of a club, but the information that passes between paedophiles on the phone, um, passing pornography back and forth to each other, knowing of another paedophile, knowing who it's safe to contact, is extremely well organized. Maurice Fraser and Terence Waters have continued to offend each time they've been released from prison. Mike Johnson may be released as early as next month. Once out of prison, no one keeps track of these men. And though paedophiles receive treatment in prison, Fraser and Waters are proof it doesn't always work. There's no doubt that, uh, particularly untreated, uh, people like him will go on offending because their fantasy is directed towards sex with children and so people in his position are clearly a danger to children and i feel betrayed and really annoyed and that they've taken some privacy away from me John Kiddy reporting. I can't forgive anybody who threatens a child, forces them to do things they don't want to do. It's wrong. The mother of one of Mike Johnson's victims. For legal reasons, we can't identify her. Her life was all but destroyed when her son finally explained what happened. And he came back in and I said, what is it? And he said, oh, I don't want to tell you. I said, well, come on, you, you can't do that. You've got to tell me. I've waited, I've been patient, I want to know. And he said, Mike was sexually abusing me and at least one other child. And I was just totally stunned. Among Mike Johnson's other innocent victims are his own family, living now in France in self-imposed exile. We haven't got any money. We've, we've had to sell the house, we've had to sell the boat. Um, and I mean... Financially, it's an absolute disaster, and it's, yeah, I mean, it's just destroyed any, anything or everything that we've set up, really. Roger Michael Johnson began his teaching career in 1971. Three years later, he was promoted to a teacher centre at Foy Hall. His love of boats and sailing were well known. He even built his own 48-foot schooner. By 1986, Johnson had moved on to become a support teacher at the Outdoor Education Centre in St Justin, Roseland. Here, he ran sailing courses for children. He used his own schooner to take children to sea in groups. The hard-working, dedicated Johnson was much respected by colleagues and by children. But there was a darker side. Stephen Green and his friend Darrell Marshall jumped ship after one violent incident. We were sailing back from the Sillies. It was a late one of the nights. I was helming the boat on the compass course, but the bearing was too high and I couldn't steer it. There was no steerage on the boat. And then we had a log out the back of the boat as well, which got entangled in the rudder when I tapped the boat twice. And he tried to untangle it. And then he started hit, or hit me on the back. It was hard. It was right in the middle of my back as well. Surely hard to hit you. Well, he just smacked me on my back and I had yeah, bruised to prove it as well. Were you scared? Yeah, I was scared. Stefan and Darrell were both interviewed by a social worker who reported his findings to County Hall. At a disciplinary hearing, Johnson admitted physical assault. The details of this were kept secret. No one outside County Hall was told that there were any reservations about Mike Johnson. Much more seriously, there were also allegations of sexual assault on two other boys, one on his yacht, the other in France during a stopover. The same social worker interviewed the victims and was convinced the assaults had happened. Those Alki allegations were not found proven. Why? I wasn't at the hearing, I couldn't say. All I can say is that the hearing 
um, had evidence presented by both sides and came to the conclusion having heard all the evidence. The social worker who took the trip's statement from children was convinced that the children were telling the truth, and yet obviously his evidence at that hearing was not accepted. Why? I wasn't at the hearing and I can't say. I can only repeat what I have just said. Well, who was at the hearing? Who, who could answer that question? Um, the hearing uh, was confidential in the sense that all uh, proceedings so far as uh, discipline inside the County Council are confidential. That is a normal practice, I think you would find. Again, the allegations against Johnson were kept secret. Not even headmasters who recommended Johnson's sailing trips were told there were any doubts about his behaviour. John Lambert says he sent his son off with Johnson on the recommendation of a head teacher. His recommendation I was very glad to receive. That recommendation effectively gave uh, at least an educational recommendation. And being that the headmaster is employed as a county employee, I presume that Johnson is held in high regard by that organisation. Johnson's bosses held him in such high regard that he was promoted to become the head of the Roseland Centre in 1990. Here, he had even greater access to children. It's a strange sort of discipline that debars anybody from ever doing another job or indeed uh, doing a good job uh, subsequent. The whole purpose of a disciplinary procedure is to make people improve. But he didn't improve. The disciplinary hearing ordered Johnson not to use his yacht for any county council purpose. He ignored the warning, and we have evidence that he used his position at Roseland to promote the very sailing trips which had led to allegations of sexual abuse. Had the county council checked their own files, they would have discovered that Mike Johnson's first job was as an assistant teacher at a school in Falmouth. A senior colleague there was sacked after allegations of child sexual abuse. The pair worked together for three years. In 1988, less than a year after that disciplinary hearing, Johnson began to set up the sailing charity which was to be known as the Azimuth Trust. Unknown to the parents who helped, one of the founding trustees was a convicted child pornographer. Roderick Morris Fraser is a psychiatrist who at one time counselled children damaged by bombing in Northern Ireland. He met Johnson through a French sailing group called École en Bateau, of which he was a director. The group takes children on long sailing trips. From letters we've obtained, Fraser was clearly the driving force behind Azimuth. He even chose the name. I have been thinking about the names, and myself see it this way. The organisation would be Azimuth, Adventure and Education Afloat, and the publication would be Seaborn. A questionnaire was sent out to children wanting to join the expeditions aboard Johnson's new yacht, the Grace O'Malley. Fraser was deeply involved in the early stages and in selecting children. They have got the questionnaire and I've suggested they fill it in and then I will send it to you, after which trial visits may be possible. I've asked that the questionnaires be returned soon. Child psychologists who studied the questionnaire say in the right hands it could be used to discover which children were vulnerable to abuse. Fraser, the psychiatrist, was precisely qualified to know. Those who met him had reservations. I thought he was odd. I didn't like his attitude towards boys, but still I thought he must be another philanthropist. He's in Azimuth. He helps with the children. It did seem strange that he took children away occasionally and lots of them stayed at his house. It seemed strange once or twice that I went there. I was only ever asked into the kitchen, never into the living room or the normal kind of places in a house you're asked into. In April last year, Fraser was jailed for possession of child pornography. He was released in June and returned to Cornwall and to Azimuth. More worrying still is the fact the General Medical Council, the doctor's governing body, have not struck him off and have no plans to do so. The council refused us an interview. Four months ago, Fraser got work in Dorset and then Southampton. He ended up here at this hospital as a locum psychiatrist. Following our phone call to the health authority, they checked with the police and discovered that Dr Fraser was indeed a convicted child pornographer. They then sacked him. It now transpires that when we called them, they were considering giving him a full-time job as a consultant psychiatrist.
Fraser lives in a block of flats in the Shirley area of Southampton. He wasn't pleased to see us. I have nothing to say to you. Uh, about setting up hazardness, Dr Fraser? I have nothing to say to you. Why did you set it up? Did you design the uh, questionnaires to the children? Nothing to say. Why did you set hazardness trust up? What was the idea behind it? Did you children on it? Doctor? You nothing to say to the families back in the West Country who you betrayed? Hiding in his flat, Dr. Fraser waited for us to leave. Instead, we tried again to get answers. You must surely regret what you've done, Dr. Fraser, don't you? I didn't do anything. You went to prison last year for possession of child pornography. That's incorrect. You were sent to prison at Southwark Crown Court in April last year, Dr. Fraser. It's a matter of record. So it's correct? It's a matter of record. Why won't you face people who want to hear answers from you, Dr. Fraser? Don't you think you owe it to people, to parents, whose children's lives have been ruined by people like you? Fraser is still legally allowed to practice as a doctor with the General Medical Council's blessing. Following our investigation, the case is now being taken to the government. I think we need to know that professional conduct committees and the General Medical Council are there to protect us, the public, and they're to protect us against those who have clearly been identified as undertaking actions which would worry even the most naive person, and that they are prepared to undertake that responsibility clearly and on our behalf. When Mike Johnson met Fraser, he may not have known that Fraser has an international group of paedophile friends. One who got involved early in Azimuth is now the subject of a police inquiry. The others aren't. We have letters from men in Spain, France, Switzerland and America. The names of British men we believe could be paedophiles have been given to Scotland Yard's obscene publications squad. There is no international body tracking paedophiles. They're not easy to spot and they can be very plausible. The first thing you've got to be, if you want to be a successful paedophile, is to be good at whatever you do. The second thing is you need to really be able to actually spot children who are vulnerable for whatever reason. And the average paedophile may actually meet hundreds and hundreds of children, but actually only make an approach to one or two. And it's the one or two vulnerable ones that they're very skillful in picking out. The parents who were duped by Johnson are angry. They trusted him because he was a teacher who gave the impression he had county council approval. The county council indeed gave Azimuth a grant, as did other public bodies. They want to know why Johnson's past was kept secret. They want to know why he was promoted at Roseland when there were already serious doubts about him. And they want to know why Johnson was still receiving job applications from Cornwall County Council as late as April this year. Ironically, this list includes one for a social worker specialising in child abuse. I can only assume that the county did not wish it to be known. I can think of no reason why they didn't wish that to be known other than that they had re-employed him and I consider that to be very dubious to say the least. The charity Kidscape also wants answers. A major loophole in the law needs to be closed. I think it's a bizarre loophole in the law. I think that anyone who has ever been convicted of abusing children should be banned for life from ever working in any capacity with children. And that I mean even as a coach driver who might transport children, a school caretaker. You'd be amazed at how good these people are at getting into jobs where they can get near children. We also ban people from driving automobiles. It seems to me that animals and automobiles are important, but children are vital. And, we, and, and it's stupid that we don't pass a law like this. Liz Johnson and her two children are now trying to rebuild their lives in France. Liz stayed with their boat after it was sold, but she has since been sacked by the sailing group which now owns the vessel. La Belle en Blanche, the white whale, is desperate not to be tarred with the same brush of paedophilia. With no home and no job, she is left to contemplate a life spent with a man who had deceived her possibly for years. I didn't know and I didn't realise that it was, you know, it was any deeper than that really. Did Mike confess to you or what? No, I, uh, the, the relationship that he had or thing, I mean, it, it, it affected the whole family. He didn't need to confess or, you know, 
and the other ones I just I mean I've found out through what other people have said I'm not through what he said and, and I mean I, it's difficult to ask somebody you trust because I mean if if you find out it, it hurts and I mean I yeah, suppose yeah, I was point, trying to avoid exactly. yeah I mean I was probably avoid, avoid I mean mm. I was mm. having had a lot of um, upset and hurt before I was probably trying to avoid any more mm. um, and if he couldn't trust me by telling me then you know I mean I, I felt that you know it was it was difficult to ask I think I understand that point I mean if someone you trust and you love confesses half the truth to you you don't want to hear the rest is that right you yeah didn't want and it also anymore. I mean if, if they confessed a certain amount um, you then have to still believe that they're telling you the truth and if they aren't I mean it, it breaks the whole whole relationship and things down anyway I asked Liz to come back to England to face the families whom her husband had betrayed she said she might come back but not until she's had time to think the legacy Mike Johnson and other paedophiles leave behind is a long and appalling one. We used to think that it was the minority sort of abuse. I think some of us are now beginning to think that maybe it's actually up at the same level as physical abuse is. And the much more worrying thing about sexual abuse is it's so much more difficult to find out about and therefore, unlike broken bones and bruises, uh, very much more difficult to treat and to help the youngsters. And we do know evidence is overwhelming that if you're abused as a child, sexually abused, your potential for abusing as an adult is really very significantly higher. And so by not actually solving the problems in one generation, we may be creating them for the next.